few weeks ago, I was walking in mission trails with my friend Ben. The poppies and mustard and the blue bonnets were all out in this wonderful array. There were all sorts of flora and fauna blooming along the trail. And because of the heavy rains this, this winter and early spring, there was actually even a little waterfall for us to sort of hike to and admire as a destination. Now, my friend Ben, he notices things while we are walking. He'll notice the caterpillar that's, that, that's on the leaf. He'll notice the red-tailed hawk that is circling overhead. He'll notice the butterfly or the lizard, and he'll greet it as a friend and a companion along the path. Ben is aware. He is engaged. And not just with the natural world around him as he walks. He's also engaged with the person who is walking with him. It is a real skill to be able to notice the bloom of a painted lady flower and to be able to discuss the finer points of Searing Kierkegaard's theology. <laughs> All at the same time, congruently and consecutively. It's a real talent. I don't have that talent. <laughs> and I don't notice things. Not usually. Not like my friend Ben. In my ignorance of my surroundings nearly cost me dearly as I nearly stepped on the head of a rattlesnake that had decided that it was a good day to bask in the ray of the sun, right there warming itself along the path. I missed it by no less than three centimeters that I nearly stepped on the head of that viper. And I do not think that is what the poet of Psalm 91 meant when the psalmist wrote, and you will tread on the lion and on the adder. <laughs> the young lion and the snake you will trample upon. I don't think that is what the psalmist meant, and I freaked out. But Ben, he was Fonzie. <laughs> he was cool. And he noticed that snake, and he noticed that that snake could really care less about me or any other human being that was walking along that path. It was just doing its thing. Its venomous, scaly, snaky thing. <laughs> it didn't have a care in the world. But if you took time to notice this snake, you would realize that it was beautiful. And it was at peace in its surroundings and harmonious in its context. If only we could be so peaceful and harmonious in our surroundings and our context. And on the rest of the walk, I was on high alert, <laughs> which you would have thought would have made me notice and to be extra vigilant to see the other snake that we <laughs> ran across just two minutes later. But nope, <laughs> I was completely unaware of that one too would have stepped right on it if it hadn't been for Ben, who was aware and engaged. My head, sisters and brothers, was on a swivel. I may have been looking all around me, but I was not seeing a darn thing. I was certainly taken out of my ability to see blessing and beauty, miracle and marvel and majesty that was all around me. My heart was going a hundred miles an hour, and I was blinded. To everything. And maybe, just maybe, that's what is going on with Mary Magdalene in our story this morning on that very first Easter. She is looking, but she is not seeing. Her head is on a swivel, but she isn't noticing anything about her. For the Gospel of John tells us that on the very first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene got her tired, weary bones out of bed and made the walk from the upper room where they celebrated Passover three days earlier outside the gates of Jerusalem to the tomb that was hewn out of rock. And it wasn't just dark outside. It was also the shadows of night were also clouding her own spirit. For violence and fear hung over her like a dark cloud of her once adventurous life of following and learning from this meek yet authoritative teacher around whom she had reoriented all of her days. The light that had once shone on her had been extinguished by the Roman cross. 
Not only was it dark in the world that morning because the sun had not come up, but it was shadowy and nighttime in her soul. And where there had once been a glimmer of hope, there was now only anxiousness, worry, fear, and despair. So while it was still dark, she came to the king, and she was astonished, surprised, shocked. She was astonished, surprised, and shocked to find the light of Easter on the other side of the tomb. She was surprised by the light that no shadow and no dark of night could overcome was on the other side of the tomb. She was surprised to find in her midst that the light that had filled the void at the very beginning of time and had come into the world, the Word made flesh, the light through which all things, the Gospel of John tells us, all things came into being. The Word, who is all life, was given life, came into being. She was just shocked and astonished and surprised to find it on the other side of the tomb. The light of the world came and found Mary and called her by her name, woke her up out of her unconsciousness and her unawareness, her sleepwalking through life, which made her unaware of all of the blessing and majesty, beauty and mystery all around her. By the light of the world, she came to see all of these things. And that, sisters and brothers, this story, this Mary Magdalene story of being astonished and shocked and astounded, this is the Christian story. It is the single most important story we have in our tradition. It is the reason why people for 90 years have been coming to the corner of Marlboro and Alder on the first Sunday after the first full moon of spring. Easter, this story, it is our heartbeat. It is our very soul. It is the very spirit of our faith. It is the hope in which we cling to. It is the promises upon which we stand. It is the very essence of us. So what is this story about? Well... Did you know that scientists have studied the mineral and chemical composition of the human body? That's right. The U.S. Bureau of Chemistry and Soils calculated that the chemical and mineral composition of the body breaks down as following. We are 65% oxygen, 18% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 3% nitrogen, 1.5% calcium, 1% phosphorus. There is less than 1% of potassium, sulfur, sodium, fluorine, magnesium, iron, iodine. Oh, and there are trace quantities of fluorine, silicon, zinc, copper, aluminum, and we are all got a little poison in us because we all got a little arsenic. <laughs> and if we took all of these chemical compositions and minerals and sold them on the common market, it would, be worth, it would be worth less than one dollar. Now, our skin is the most valuable part of us. I am told that it's worth about three dollars and fifty cents. So all added up, we are worth less than five dollars. You can't even get a subway footlong for us. But take a moment now and put your fingers on the base of your neck or on your wrist. Go ahead, do it. And let's just be quiet for a second. And what do you feel? A heartbeat. You feel your pulse. You feel the mystery of biological life beating through your five dollars of chemical composition and minerals. Do you know how that works? Do you understand how the five dollars of chemicals and minerals adds up to you? Or the person sitting next to you? Or the person sitting in the highest office in the land? Or the person who slept at War Canyon Park last night? That's what Easter is all about. Easter is about the power of life, of creation, of new life, of recreation. Easter is the power that makes the $5 worth of elements and minerals and chemical pop compositions priceless, beautiful, a miracle, a blessing, a marvel. Easter is that power that gave you that pulse, calling us by name and promising us that long after that pulse stops beating, that that power will go on. 
It is called eternal life, sisters and brothers. And it doesn't just stop, start after your pulse starts. Because Easter assures us that eternal or abundant life, what the Gospel of John calls in Greek zoe, not only goes on forever, but is also available to us here and now. You see, we all know that we and every single human being, nay, every single organism, is worth more than just the chemical composition of their minerals and their elements. We know we are worth far more than the sum of our biological parts, and that more, as Marcus Borg calls it, is what Easter is all about. Easter addresses that universal longing to tap into more. You might call it meaning, you might call it peace, you might call it purpose. St. Teresa of Avila called it the longing for God, the restlessness that only finds rest in God. The great 20th century theologian Paul Tillich called it the ground and power of our being. Aretha Franklin, our good soul sister, called it the spark that fires the heart. And Samuel L. Jackson, playing the role of Jules in Pulp Fiction, called it the hand of God that touched me. (laughs) And all of us are seeking it one way or another. We want to know more. We want to feel more. We want to know God deep in our hearts. And Easter is the Christian answer to this longing that all of us have. It is knowing that death is not the end and the pulse alone is not living. But you are not surely, but if you are not surely exactly what that means, if you are all kind of in the dark about that, let me tell you, sisters and brothers, you're in good company this day. Because you see, Mary came to the tomb thinking that death was the end of Jesus. She comes in the dark, presumably to prepare Jesus' five dollars worth of minerals and chemical composition for burial. She's resigned by the finality of death, and she is grieving. At first, she is not aware, due to her anxiousness and fear and grief of the new life that is all around her. She does not recognize the garden that she's walked into is the recreation of the Garden of Eden. But when the risen Christ calls her name, she knows it deep down inside. And so maybe today you relate to Mary. Maybe this Easter you're resigned to the futility of life and the awful finality of death. Maybe it's because you've experienced death of a beloved friend and family member. I know I have. Perhaps it is the death that pervades our culture, that these random acts of terror and gun violence. Today, or this weekend, is the 20th anniversary of the shooting at Columbine High School. I know that death permeates through me. Perhaps the death of our morals and ethics, decency and dignity in our public discourse and the rhetoric of the people we've elected to the highest offices permeates a death through you this day. Perhaps the death that is caused by climate change and climate challenges and the warming of our planet and the extinction of species each and every day is a death that permeates through you this day. Maybe even one or more of these things has convinced you that there's not much sense in this life and although you are breathing and your heart is beating, it is also breaking this day if that is the case sisters and brothers you are in good company because the great african-american poet james weldon johnson writes of this tension between the futility of life and the finality of death and god's more and god's promises of zoe and the trust in god's promises of resurrection in his poem when he writes oh now O lord When I have done drunk my last cup of sorrow, when I have been called everything but a child of God, when I have done traveling up the rough side of the mountain, oh, Mary's baby, when I start deep the steep and slippery steps of death, when this old world begins to rock beneath my feet, lower me to my dusty grave in peace to wait for that great getting up morning. Well, wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey, children, because the great getting up day is here. God Zoe is bursting bursting forth in the world, and it is time to bask in the God's recreation of hope and light, love and peace this day, because the great getting up morning is here. Yesterday, I, while it was still dark, I was up early and took my German shepherd, Baloo, for a walk just as the sun was coming up. It was around 6.20 a.m. in the morning, and shockingly, in normal height, there were very few people up at 6.20 on a, mor- on a Sunday morning. But that does not mean I was alone. The birds were out, 
lots and lots and lots of birds. And those birds were singing. Morning had broken like the first morning. Blackbird had spoken like that first bird. Praise for the singing. Praise for the morning. Praise for them springing fresh from the word. It was a chorus that just wouldn't stop, sisters and brothers. They sang and sang and sang and sang until they didn't. And I was sad because I thought the concert was over. When I got to the corner of 35th and Monroe Street, all of a sudden there was a stark silence. But then my joy returned because I realized that their silence wasn't the end of the concert, but merely a transition from one act to the other. And as I started back toward my house, a new song began to sing. But this time it wasn't a chorus, it was a solo. A deep, strong serenade of one lone owl. In the trees somewhere in that block. And I couldn't locate it. And I looked all around, trying to zero in on which branch it sat. That hooting song of this owl seemed all around me. It was a cacophony of song. And the sun started to rise over the houses in the neighborhood, making the dew on the grasses glisten. Mine is the sunlight. Mine is the morning. Born of the one light that Eden saw play. Praise for elation. Praise every morning. God's recreation of the new day. Easter is the promise of that power that oriented the sun, gave voice to that owl, and gave you the pulse flowing through your veins will never abandon you because today is your great getting up day. The power that rolled away that stone and raised Jesus from the dead can raise you up too because that same power is calling you by name and still doing good work, doing a new thing in you and in the world because it is the great getting up day. Easter is the promise that nothing in your past, present, or future has the ultimate power to define you. You are defined by the power of Zoe, God's loving, gracious energy that flows through you, that light of God that flows through you and through all of creation, making all things new because it is the great getting up day. And if this power that gives life and this main thing that John wants us to know, he tells us that this is what we might have life and this is where we might find meaning on Easter, the more of life, the light that shines in the darkness that cannot that light and uh, that darkness and shadow and night cannot overcome this god's zoe present in history and the here and now is there for you because it is your great getting up day someone give me an amen put your hand on your pulse again mine is going a thousand beats a second Just as surely as the blood is pulsing through your veins right now, this pulsing is the zoe of Christ. It is the life that cannot die. It is pulsating through you and all of creation. For God is making things new. We are called by name on our great getting up morning to awaken us to the eternal truth so that we may marvel at the miracle and the majesty, the mystery and blessing, the beauty of God's recreation, and share in the hope that we stand on, the peace that we lean on, and that we share this and provide it for all the world, because today, sisters and brothers, it is the great getting up day. And that, my friends, is the reason for all of our hallelujahs. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.